right, we're going to be talking about 34 numerical integrations. So if you haven't downloaded that from Moodle, do so. If you downloaded it last week, you need to go back and re-download it because I changed my mind about how I was going to approach it from last week to this week. Um, I sent out emails this morning to anyone that is behind in work. So if you have not received an email from me, congratulations, you're caught up. If you have, you have a list of anywhere from one to mm, that many assignments that you need to get caught up on. Uh, I strongly encourage you to work towards getting caught up on those things. We are scheduled to have a test in here next Wednesday over integration. So that's kind of what's on your docket right now. Now we have learned how to integrate the basic thing, the, the most common thing we use is a power rule. We've been doing that for over a month now. We've learned to do integration by substitution with the you do substitutions. We learned that and we took a quiz over that. Uh, by the way, I'll give you those quizzes back in a little while. Y'all help me remember that. Um, you've learned a few trig rules. You've got some to identify. But try as you might some things we cannot find an antiderivative for. You are more than welcome to try and find an antiderivative for, some, for this function that I've got here, sine of x squared, and you cannot find it. If you look at the graph of it, and this is the graph of it from 0 to pi over 2, there's obviously, it's obviously a continuous function. It obviously has area. So there has to be a way to do that. But mathematically, we don't have the tools and are not going to get the tools between now and May in order to find that area. I don't know. I have never been a part of it. Some things, yes. When you learn to do integration by parts in calculus BC or in college, then there is some of that that you can do. Something like this, I don't know that you can find an antiderivative for. I really don't. But So if we are asked to integrate something like this from 0 to pi over 2 of the sine of x squared, it's an impossible task to do algebraically. All we can do is estimate what that is. Okay? Now, when I say estimate, does that bring back any memories to you? Because we did a little estimating early on. How do we estimate? Limits. Limits. Riemann sums. Remember we did left Riemann sums? We did right Riemann sums? Those of you that, did, uh, that have already done the FRQs for this week ran into one called a midpoint Riemann sum this week, okay? All of those are estimates. What did we find is the difficulty with using those estimates? They're wrong. They're wrong. Yeah, they, they are estimates. But even as estimates, would you classify them as good estimates always? No, why not? I mean, just for example, if we're trying to find this, uh, if we're using that as our interval there, Obviously, that rectangle is not going to be a very good estimation of what the area is right there. It's going to be an underestimate. That's not going to be a very good estimation either because it's going to be an overestimate. Even if we did a midpoint, which midpoint means go in the middle and make a rectangle there, that might be a little bit better, but still, all of them have their limitations. So these are ways that you can do that, and I, I did that poorly. Let me go back and try that again. We say it's going to be right here. That's the middle of it there. So even with those, none of those are going to give us great um, estimates of it there. Okay, but not perfect. What we often do, or a method that is widely accepted, is to use something called the trapezoidal rule. Okay, because if you remember, if you go back to when we started this process and I told you to estimate the answer, estimate the area under that, many of you started drawing triangles because you said, oh, okay, I can draw, draw a triangle from here down to here. And it's, that looks like a pretty good estimation of it, doesn't it? So if it's a nice, smooth curve that doesn't make any dramatic jumps, 
that would be a better estimation than either the left or the right or the midpoint. So what if we're going, let's take this example right here and let's break it up into four trapezoids. That uh, was going to be my next question. Does anybody know what a trapezoid is? The way that you've probably seen trapezoids is something like that, where two sides are parallel. It could be like that. It could be like this. Both of these would be examples because these sides are, are parallel. We're going to draw our trapezoids so that they look like this. Okay? Kind of like the side of a house. So our parallel sides are going to be here, and we're going to connect the two endpoints. So just for example, if we want to take this region right here, and let's break it up into four. This is from zero to pi over four. No, pi over two, I'm sorry. Zero to pi over two. How would you break that up into four equal trapezoids? Um, yes, sir. Pi over eight, two pi over three, pi over four, pi over pi over eight, pi, two pi over three, two pi over three is even bigger than that. Wait, no, wait, no, two pi over eight, yeah, that's it. Pi over eight. I'm gonna write it like this, but you're right. It's pi over four, three pi over eight, and pi over two or four pi over eight. Those are the places that we would want to find this at, okay? So let's look at what that would look like. Pi over eight, this is, this is pi over two, so halfway between there. I am just kind of eyeballing these things, okay? These are not gonna be right, so these are not gonna be exact. If that's pi over eight, that's two pi over eight, three pi over eight, and four pi over eight. You all with me? So now we've got a trapezoid here, okay? We've got another trapezoid here. We've got another trapezoid here, even though it kind of looks like a rectangle. And we've got another trapezoid here. So if we look at those four blue things that I drew there, don't you think that's a better estimation than four rectangles there? Yeah. It's going to be much closer to it, okay? So now all we need to do is find the area of these four trapezoids. Anybody remember how to find the area of a trapezoid? Um, uh, area? Rectangle area and a triangle area, just looking at it, that looks like it would be a good assumption, and it is. The formula that you developed back years ago, and I'm going to draw one out here, we call the two parallel sides the bases, okay? And this is the height. A formula that you learned back when you were learning all the area formulas is one half B1 plus B2 times H. You remember seeing that formula somewhere? One half base one plus base two times H. So you're going to add the two parallel sides together, multiply it by the height, and divide by two. So now let's think about this, though. In our case, our trapezoids are going to be turned up like this. Okay? So where is our height at in this figure here? Right. It's height, but it's a width. We're going to think of it more as a width because we're looking at it in this manner. These two are our sides. Okay? So how are we going to find the area of this first rectangle of this first trapezoid right here. It's going to be one half times what's going to be the height or the width of this? How wide is that? Uh, pi, over eight. pi over eight. How tall is this side? Not Zero. Zero. How tall is this side? Let's, we, we can know exactly what it is. What is it? Plug what into who? who? Right, so this is actually the sign of pi over 8 quantity squared, right? Let's go down here so I can write that so you can actually read it somewhere. Oh, I'm terrible with my notes today. 
My deepest apologies. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. So we've got one half pi over eight. The sine of zero squared. The sine of pi over eight squared. Okay. So that would find us the area of the first one. Would you agree? And I mean, you, you can calculate that. I don't know, you know, with a calculator, you could get answers for all of that. But what's going to be the second one then? That's our first one. Second one's going to be one half. Now, how wide is the second one? Is it pi over four? Is it two pi over eight? Is it pi over eight? Which one is it? How wide is the rectangle? How far is it from here to here? It's going to be pi over 8. Pi over 8 again. How long is this side? How do we find that side that I just drew in green? That's right. It's the sine of pi over 8 squared plus What's the what's the next one going to be then? Sine of pi over four. I'm going to stop doing it that way and start doing it the right way. Squared. Y'all realize with this we're supposed to square and then take the sine. Square and then take the sine on these. Square it and then take the sine. Square it and then take the sine. Ah, stop doing that, Ely. Eight squared. Boom. We're adding those together. And again, this is just calculation stuff now to do. Would you agree with that? What's going to be the next rectangle, uh, next trapezoid? One half. Pi over eight. Pi over 4 squared plus sine of 3 pi over 8 squared. You seeing a pattern? Everybody kind of see a pattern to this? You've always, in this one, we've always got the 1 half. We've always got the pi over 8. And the last one is the first one. I understand what I'm saying there? This one becomes this one. This one becomes this one. So we know in the next one that we're going to have one half pi over eight. This last one that we had, the sine of three pi over eight squared plus the sine of pi over two or four pi over eight squared. That gives us our four trapezoids. So this would be a way to approximate. How could we get a better approximation? More what? More trapezoids. Instead of four trapezoids, we could do five or six or eight or 60, however many we wanted there, okay? But this is just another way of estimating along with the left and the right and midpoint, we could do trapezoids. There's another rule, it's called Simpson's rule, we're not going to go into it, that actually uh, takes into consideration, the instead of making it a trapezoid, makes it kind of like a oval at the top there. That'll even get a better approximation. So we're not going, we're not going to go into that. But this is all you need, these are the things you need to be able to do is left Riemann sums, right Riemann sums, midpoint Riemann sums, and trapezoidal rules, okay? Any questions about anything I've gone over here? It's not that high, it's not as in-depth as some of the other things we've done. Let's look at another problem here. Approximate the area by finding the area of the trapezoids. Now, there's eight subintervals there. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's eight bodies in here. How about that? 
So what if so what if we pooled our efforts and everybody found the area of one trapezoid here, okay? Wesley, you're finding the area of the first trapezoid, the second trapezoid, the third trapezoid, the fourth trapezoid. Sue, will you join us and do the fifth trapezoid, the sixth trapezoid, the seventh, and the eighth? I'll put little numbers up here for you, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Remember our formula is one half the height times B1 plus B2. And I'll give you an opportunity to find all of those and then we'll put together what you had there. I'm going to do something else while that's doing this. Excuse me? Yes, go ahead and actually get, get an actual number for us, please. Yeah, I think I did something wrong. Okay. Why do you think that? Well, according to this, the answer is less than the area of the first one is less than, oh, never mind, never mind, never mind. I just saw where the one was. So let's see what we got here. Wesley, what did you get for the first one you said? Uh, 0.07514. Okay. Second one. Connor, oh, you're still working there? Anyone have a third one for us? Uh, it is 1.387. 387. Okay. The fourth one? One two. Point one two o oh, two four two. Okay. Five. Okay. Six. Three six two eight. Okay. Seven. Point three seven eight. And A is Okay. What you get? Point three seven eight. That was for the fifth one. Point three seven eight. Okay. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Okay. I think all of yours are just wrong, actually. <laughs> I don't know. Connor, what did you get, sir? Uh, point two five six. Point two five six five Well, do we see problems with this potentially? Yes. Yes? 
what kind of problems do we see here? Mm-hmm. 0.056. 0.056. Okay. What kind of problems do we see with what we've got up here? It's nasty and... I would expect to see some symmetry here. Wouldn't you? I mean, especially when... The, the, the eight and a uh, one and eight match, but point three two oh two. I would expect two and seven to match. I would expect three and six to match. I would say four and five do match because one rounded to three and one rounded to four. Okay, so so let's go back and investigate the second one to begin with. So that's going to be one half. How wide are these things? One half times pi over eight times the sine of pi over eight plus the sine of pi over four. Would y'all agree with it? Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Do you see why I'm saying pi over eight and pi over four? Because you're on this rectangle, so that side is at pi over 8. That side is at pi over 4. So you're going to add the two together there. And so that, that's you're using, why am I using the sine of pi over 8 and the sine of pi over 4? Because that's what our function was, y equals sine of x, okay? So if you would kind of go back and do those calculations and see what you get there. Did you want to amend yours? 0 0.213 for number 7. That's what you want to call it this time, 0 0.213, okay? Uh, now, what about 3 and 6? Okay, you got 0.3628, and you got 0.3202. So let's look at those. Let's look at number 3. Number 3 would be 1 half pi over 8 times the sine of pi over 4 plus the sine of 3 pi over 8, right? Is that what you did, sir? Yes. All right, you're in radian mode, okay, and then yours, .3489 is what she just got. She got a new one for, from all of you there. Where's, okay, .5 times pi over 8. 3 pi over 8. You put these last two in parentheses, right? The sine of pi over 4 and the sine of 3 pi over 8. Hold on, I missed the parentheses. Okay. I got it like, like 0.5. 0.5. Uh, that, that doesn't sound right. I'm still getting the 0.3202. Okay. Would you go back and rework yours, Mayor Martin, just to see? Let's see. Like, what's wrong with that? Okay. Three? All right. You did the answer, parentheses. I got two, point one. Three, two, oh, What's two. my answer? Oh, yeah. yeah, my answer should be the pi over 8 times uh, pi. Is Those, I think you're missing a parenthesis. I think I just got okay. I think you are missing a parenthesis on this. All right, so we're going to go back to point three two oh two here. Okay. So, what do you have for two now? All right, good. And then to estimate them all, we would simply add them up. Now, would you qualify this as hard mathematics? But it's tedious mathematics, you agree? Lots of places to make mistakes. And in today's world, there's absolutely no reason to do that by hand. Would you agree with that assessment? Yes. I mean, because here you go. Here's a nice little graph that I found. I did not create this. Somebody else with more time on their hand did. You put in the function. I want a Riemann sum. So there, uh, excuse me, a trapezoidal rule. So I picked two. Uh, I don't have to do, tell it how many rectangles I want. I picked eight. 
Whether I want to start zero, whether I want to stop 3.14 and 1.9742. I mean, there's no reason for us to go through this exercise necessarily for functions such as this. So you're going to have to go through very few of them, a few, but very few of them in order to be able to do this in, uh, just so you've got the experience and understanding. You will, however, see scenarios like this where it is a good exercise because we don't know what the name of this function is. We can't go in here and simply say, okay, well, I'll put all that stuff into the Desmos and boom, it'll give me an answer. So if we're given a graph, and suddenly now we have something that would be a good candidate to do the trapezoidal rule. So let's take this one and let's work it together. Why don't y'all get in groups of two or three and work through it together? I think you need the practice you need the practice of going through all of them and find out the area of all eight trapezoids there, okay? And then sum them up at the end, okay? You want to make it into eight regions and trapezoids. Go. Guys, get focused and Bless you. Bless you.
No, I, I estimated it though. So, you know, your answer may differ slightly. Yeah. Your answer may differ slightly than mine because I estimated on some. You may have just rounded. There's no problem with that. But you should get close to the ballpark, I would think, there. Looks like you're looking at rectangles and not trapezoids. Well, I just did the triangles. I did okay, you did rectangles and triangles. Okay. Robert has his methods. Con okay. Okay, you, you matched up there? Well, right. I didn't get it right at first because I thought it went up to 6 and not 5.5, but then when you said that. But it's okay, I mean. <laughs> oh, duh, I messed the very first one. That was, a, that's kind of embarrassing. That's kind of embarrassing. Uh huh. Duh. How did you end up with a point five? We only use five when we get there. Yeah. Say that again. So it's the number three and four. I only like three plus five. I think it's five. I didn't get the point five. Okay, so you got. So we got the same answer. Yeah. All right. So you got what four and seven there? Yeah. Okay. You did six and one. Okay. So the, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be it's going to be an estimate no matter what. These are the type problems that show your computations that lead to your answer. That's that's going you know you've got to show what you did because just the answer of 42 doesn't do us any good. We want to see how you got there because you'll get credit based on that there. Okay. So do you understand what the process would be like this? But re but Let's be honest here. Realistically, real world, there's probably not a, value, a lot of value for this, is it? Okay. Okay. Now let's get to realistic, real world that there is some value to it, okay? Something like this is much more likely and all, much more likely to come up and much more beneficial in a real life, okay? So imagine you are surveying a piece of land and you're trying to determine how much area is in that land. Well, most land doesn't have nice straight boundaries all around. We're blessed that this one has two nice straight boundaries, but everything else is really rugged as far as what the boundaries are, okay? So how are you going to approximate the area? Trapezoidal rule is a very good way to use this. Now I'm going to show you an easy way to do this, though, okay? Notice that we have the tables of data over here. So you, the, the graph is nice to look at, but it's not necessary for figuring out your answer. Okay, we're going to have the answer by simply drawing trapezoids. There's one, there's two, three, four, five, and then another one which comes down here to six, seven, eight, nine. I've got ten trapezoids there, okay? So now I can use the trapezoid, and I can do this the same way that we've done before. Or, if I'm smart enough, I can take some shortcuts. All right? What, in every problem, it's had a one-half so far, right? So wait till the end, divide by two, like Mr. Dietrich is saying back there. What about the widths of all of these? The widths of all of these were the same. The widths of all of these are the same, right? So you can wait till the end to multiply by that. So I can just know at the end I've got a one half. I can know at the end I've got a 100 because the widths are all 100 here. Now, pay close attention. Pay close attention. I cannot factor this 100 out if all of the widths are not the same. There are going to be problems where they're not all the same. You've run into one on an FRQ recently. 
Y'all remember the one where you were doing the left remind sums and some of them were 30 wide, some were 10 wide, some were 20 wide? Okay. So you can do all of that there. You got another shortcut for us? But it won't be as accurate there. Because th think about this. Let's take an extreme example here, okay? This is our... What if we've got from 0 to 500 to 600? You know, that 500 times that is going to be a better estimate than just saying 300 times that. So if they're, if they're not even... Because, see, if you're, if you're using the data, let's say that's 1,000. Let's say that's, I don't know, 400 and 300. Okay? If we do one half, 500 times 1,400. Okay? So that's going to be a half. Uh, that's going to be 700 times 500. That's 0, 0, 0, 0, 35,000. Now, what if we, see, if we change that to 300, we're going to get a smaller number there. So it'd be off a little bit. Uh, you might be able to. You might be able to. But if all of the widths are the same, you can factor out the width, you can factor out the one half. You can factor out the one half no matter what. You can then factor out the width. So now all I've got to do is add up my y values. The first one we know is going to be what? 125 plus 125. That's right. Are y'all y'all with me now? To get the rest of this here, we're going to add these two together. 125 plus 125. Exactly. Yes, if you can see that, what you can actually do here and what if, if you look in some books, if you go talk to mathematicians that have studied this lately, they're going to say, ah, oh, did you learn the trapezoidal rule formula? And there is a formula for it. You can say, I'm going to use the first one one time, the 125. Then I'm going to say two times all of the ones in the middle, 125 plus 120 plus 112 plus 90 plus 90 plus 95 plus 88, plus 75, plus 35, and then I'm going to use the last one one time. So when you're given discrete data, that works much better, much easier on you, and you don't have as much room for error, as much room for making mistakes with it and all. You use the end ones twice, the ones in the middle you use two times. And all of that is predicated on the fact that the Discrete data is in equal intervals all the way across. If they're not, then you need to go back and find actually the trapezoids there, okay? Yes, please. So that's going to be 50. Uh, 245, 345, 357, 537. Oh my goodness, I can't do this in my head. Y'all have, have calculators. Y'all can figure this out. I'm not smart enough. Yep. Okay. 89,000. Look at page 1,508. What page? 1,508. Oh, yeah, I know. I have to see. Wait, what? What? Did you want? She got 89,250. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Times, times your 50, yeah. So that's roughly the area of that. And this would be 
this would be a way to actually estimate what the area of a piece of property is there. So surveyors would actually use this, believe it or not. So any questions about using the trapezoidal rule or making trapezoids as an estimation method? Did other people get that? 89,250? Did you get that, Chase? Yeah. Okay. All right. This is tedious, tedious, tedious arithmetic work, and I don't like that stuff. But anyway, I am completed. I have completed all the lecturing that's going to be done before next Wednesday. Okay. I think there are four whole problems on this to do in your assignment tonight. Okay. So you just need the practice of doing those things. You've got uh, some web assigns due. Today's what, Thursday? Yes, today's Thursday. You've got some web assigns due. There is an integration review packet already out on Moodle. If you haven't looked at it yet, I encourage you to, to look at it. The most difficult thing, in my opinion, about the test is going to be you've got to know when to do what. It's going to be virtually all integration isn't it out there? Yeah. When do you do you do? When is LNs? When is E's? When is it just power? When do you use trig? So you that's the most important thing for you to get all of that squared away. It, that home the homework assignments you haven't got into me yet, those few of you that are in that scenario, get them to me so I can give you some feedback on what you're doing wrong. If you've got problems, if you've got questions, if you've got issues, ask me so we can get going on that. You've got the rest of the day. You've got tomorrow to ask so questions. Quick recap on e. e, yes. I, okay. I understand the idea of like keeping okay. E's as exponents. I don't understand how they're getting like I'll give you one of them. Okay. Okay, um the indefinite integral of five minus e uh, divided by e to the nine. Okay, dx. All right, we all know from the video that you watched that the integral of e to the x is e to the x. So, when you any time you see a fraction like this, and by the, like this I mean there's a monomial in the bottom. One thing, my first thought is I'm going to either move this up and distribute it, or I'm going to split it up. But if it's if there's a monomial in the bottom, you don't have to have a fraction. So I'm going to bring this up and make it 5 minus e to the x times e to the negative 9x dx. Now I'm going to distribute it through. So I'm going to have 5 e to the ni negative 9x minus e. What do I, when I multiply, what do I do with my exponents? Add and get negative 8x dx. So now I'm going to integrate this. Okay, here's what I'm going to think of. I'm going to think of it as two separate problems. I'm going to look at just the first one. What should you be in the first one? Negative. All right, so u is negative 9x. So du is negative 9. So one, negative 1 ninth du equals dx. Oh, that's where I was going. I didn't know I was trying to figure out. So I'll have negative five ninths. So that'll give me negative five ninths e to the negative five e to the negative nine x. Okay. Now when I, I'm going to look at the second part out here, and if you want to keep it together, I'm going to say b is negative eight x. So dv is negative eight dx. So I've got a negative one eight <coughs> there. Okay. So I've got a minus sign already. I've got a negative. That's going to make it positive one eight. I'm integrating e to the u, so it's just going to be e to the u. Yeah. That's just what I. I must Does that help? Yeah. With everything with ease, almost you're going to need to do a u substitution. Okay. When I see something like that, when I see 
e to the square root of 7x over the square root of 7x. Now, I look at that. Is bringing this thing up into the problem going to allow me to distribute it through? Not really. Okay. If I let my u be my denominator, I can't take the derivative of this and introduce an e anyhow, anyway. So I'm going to say, well, the only thing I can try is say, let's let u be the square root of 7x. If that's the case, then du is 1 half that thing to the negative 1 half times 7. You with me? All right. Well, now something to the negative 1 half, that's really the same as 1 times the 7 that I had over 2 square root of 7x. Right? And, oh, I, wait a minute, I've got a 7x, square root of 7x in my denominator. So my du becomes 7 over 2 times 1 over the square root of 7x dx. That's right. So I need a 2 sevenths back over here to make this thing look like I expect it to look. So if I do that, now I can integrate this as 2 sevenths, the integral of e to the u du, because I can put in du in place of this thing right here and u for that up there. So I can get 2 sevenths, 2 sevenths e to the square root of 7x. Okay, if I'm trying to integrate something like that, okay, e being uh, u being negative x doesn't help me any. So what I'm going to look at is bring. I can't bring this up and help me any because it's not a monomial. So I'm probably going to think of what happens when the denominator is my u. If u is 1 plus e to the negative x, then du becomes, that's going to fall away, negative e to the negative x. Right? Well, I've kind of got that up there. So I can make it negative du equals e to the negative x dx. Now when I plug that in, I've got a negative integral for this. I can put in my u, du, it leaves me a 1 in the top, and for 1 plus e to the x is u. Well, what's the integral of 1 over u? What's an antiderivative for 1 over u? Ln. Ln. I've got minus ln of the absolute value of u plus c, and I know that my u was what, 1 plus e to the negative x plus c. That's very, that, that's kind of challenging that to get to. All right, all right. I got that one. That's the problem. Yep. I got that one and I didn't get the e to the square root of 7x. Yep. Yes, sir. Okay, so I remember Mr. Alchester when we were talking about this. Nope, when the bell rings you can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Ye